Welcome back, everybody, to the Free Range Musician. We're here today with the wonderful Joe Pereira. He is the principal timpanist of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Um, that, that's big enough in itself. He's, he's also currently runs the percussion studio at the University of Southern California. Um, he's, ha he's also a composer, had his music nominated for Grammys in 2013. Um, he, he does it all, guys, and we're so happy to have him on um, for the channel today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great, so today we're gonna to be asking you some questions about your practice routine, performance preparation, and all of that kind of stuff. So we'd like to start with, can you describe to us your current warm-up routine? Current warm-up routine? Um, well, you know, I have to say, I don't think a Tiffany player warm-up routine is as, as detailed as a brass player's. Okay. Um, we're, we're dealing with, you know, larger muscle groups, basically. We're not dealing with these little tiny, you know, muscles. So it's more of just getting loose physically. And um, for timpani, for example, because the instrument takes up such a large space, uh, right. it's just, just like, again, moving, like, I, I do this thing that's like really exaggerated. You may mm -hmm. even see me do it on stage right before the concert starts. Just kind of working on that touch because it's not like piano where we can feel mm -hmm. we have stick which is like you know i don't know 14 inches or whatever long so it's like we're feeling with this thing that's out here you know from our hands so it's like just getting like the fluidity happening with the arms and the body and the feeling but also like what does it feel like when it's actually making contact so i'm just doing this really slow exaggerated really legato motion like up to drums and back down mm -hmm. i mean that's like after that i feel pretty good i don't have to really you know go really crazy to feel like i'm in control of what i'm about to do um it's just about getting loose and trying to stay loose and if it never getting tense you know that's what i teach a lot to the students is not uh, and, to, and to emulate you know what you guys do what wind players do and string players you know um the speeds of the rhythm, speeds of the rhythms equal the the air or the physical motion that goes into a note. So that so each rhythm has a character and the speed, some of like I was telling them also it's like a conductor. We should be able to kind of visually see um, the rhythms that you're playing based on the speed that you're moving your arm or your hand or your wrist, you know. Um, and to me, I, I, I simulate like breathing, like if you're if you're playing forte, you know, you're, a lot of the air is forced and going out quickly. Same thing with a stroke. It should emulate that instead of, because the, the tendency for the young student is in percussion is just to like, everything is the same motion because they're focused on playing the music and they're looking at the music, but they're not thinking about or using their body in an efficient way. So it's all about efficiency. So do you encourage them to actually breathe with their playing in certain ways? Or is that just metaphorical? Just metaphorical. Um, but yes, yes and no. I mean, I don't actually make them breathe, like tell them to physically breathe, but I tell them to sing it. Like, what does it sound, what does it sound like if you sing it? You know, because a lot of things are like, I always say too, it's like, because I remember back in, like when I was like a freshman or early undergrad, when you're in the sightseeing classes and we had this rhythm book where you just clapped out the rhythms. You know, that's, that's great for learning basic rhythmical, you know, uh, basic rhythms, but, uh, on an instrument, especially timpani or percussion or any instrument, you can you can play the correct rhythm, but it has no character. It doesn't have the correct rhythmical character of the eighth note at quarter note equals eighty in twelve eight time. You know whatever it may be. So um, that's to me that that singing of how like the air would come out is the same thing that I try to teach with uh, the stroke speeds to give it the right character and sound. So you think um, as far as improving rhythmic reading and sight reading goes, would you recommend singing as the, as the main thing? Do you have any other tips you would do to improve those things? Um, you know, it's mostly, it's mostly just, um, and, and I also encourage like, um, because they all want to be in an orchestra, all my students. Mm -hmm. They all come to USC because me and my colleague are in the LA Phil that, that, we, that we're their teachers. So they all assume they're going to get an orchestra job. So I try to, singing actually feels a lot I think it's the most natural thing because that's what we all can do. Uh, basically, we can all do it. 
to some point, although you don't want to hear me sing. Um, but I try to compare it to other orc to other instruments in the orchestra because that to me seems more to them it seems more familiar. Like, oh, this is this is like I, I call these types of notes pizzicato notes. Like, uh, if you imagine a double bass, how do they do they do they hit the bass the string? No, they they pull it out. So how can you make a sound when you're pulling it out? So I like to um, draw these analogies, and I say I tell them you're going to spend most of your career simulating the other instruments. I yeah. think that's a good way to think about it. Definitely. Great. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about performance preparation. Um, and so when you record yourself in a practice session, what things should students be listening for? And are these things similar to what you'd listen for uh, on an audition panel? Um, yeah, I mean, the short answer to that is, and I say it all the time, it's just fundamentals. Like, and I, and I was recently on the principal oboe committee in Yale Phil, and I've been on a trumpet uh, committee for the fourth trumpet a few years ago. Um, and our principal percussion audition we've had with Matt Howard, who was at USC a few years ago, actually, uh, one of our students. But uh, fundamentals, meaning like being in, playing in time and playing in tune. Because, uh, and playing in time and playing in time, there's a, that's kind of a very wide answer because I, I noticed, you know, the committees are usually made up of, um, you know, people don't realize this, committees are usually made up of 10 people and they may only be one or none. Like in a principal timpani audition, for example, there's no timpani players on the committee usually. Maybe an assistant timpanist if they have one. You know, so you have 10 people, string players, wind players, brass players, uh, and maybe a percussion player. Um, on the committee so you have all these other musicians and the, the the number one comment from everyone every time we talk about the, the round or, or deciding is the number one comment is uh it was it was um it was too fast or i can't play with that it was too i couldn't hear it because it was too quick and didn't sit right that's always the number one comment like it's never like oh he missed a note so you know we have to in percussion we have to play these bach now standard like Bach violin sonatas and partitas and cello suites on marimba. And it's really hard. And there's no way you're going to play all the right notes and you're playing a half hour and you're playing all these different instruments. And everyone is so freaked out about, oh, I'm going to play a wrong note. And then the audition, they hit a wrong note and they just slowly crash and burn the whole time. Mm -hmm. like that's, it was never, ever a comment on any audition. Oh, yeah, he would have gotten a job, but he played a wrong note. You know, it's always like, I couldn't play with that player because they played that excerpt too fast and we don't play it that way and they're usually right you know yeah great so, so uh, um cycling back a little bit to practicing can you take us through a typical practice session for you after your um your little warm-up just now for like preparing for concerts or rehearsals with the orchestra or like when i was taking auditions i i'd be curious to hear about when you were taking auditions yeah so um the first thing I realized was you have to be really organized. I mean, especially for us, because I think for, for you guys too, I'm not just, I'm just considering like we had so many instruments and like when I, when I won my job at the New York Philharmonic, it was assistant timpani section percussion. So I, it's the only person in the orchestra that really plays in two different sections technically. So there was a whole list of percussion excerpts and there was a whole list of timpani excerpts. So you can imagine you can't really, at first you can't really even get to everything in one day. Mm -hmm. It's just too much. Um, and I was practicing like 18 hours because I, I was so like, I was studying in New York and Juilliard and I wanted to really get that job because they were my teachers. So um, it's just too much. So you have to, I realized pr pretty quickly that you have to first like in the morning, first thing, or even the night before, make a list of all the things that you really need to do the next day and stay and stick to it because you can easily get off. You know, you can spend all day on one, on one thing, you know, this phrasing and this one's always out of tune. So I'm going to work on this. And you, three hours later, you're like, Oh, well, I don't have time to fix something else. So I had like different things worked out where like, it was like, I'm going to hit these problems in the morning for these first two hours on these two instruments. And then after that, I'm going to do a mock. I'm just going to run maybe only part of this list, not, not everything. I'm just going to do these other things, take a break, give yourself a break from that. 
you have to be very strategic, I found out. And, and then, okay, lunch, during lunch, maybe I'll um, study some scores or whatever, come back and do something else. And then later on, maybe listen to that mock that I did. And because and, I feel like it can be more critical if you give some time, it can be super yeah. critical of it, you know. So just being strategic about it. Um, that's what I did. And it's really, I think this goes for everyone. You can't, you can't kind of uh, burn out too, too soon. I think if you have a month, that's more than enough time. Mm-hmm. This is assuming, you know, you're older and ready to take a real audition. Um, about a month so the first two weeks or so is just like ironing out details. And I spend a lot of time, I tell this, my students a lot, like study the scores, study, um, the, now you have YouTube. When I was taking auditions, we didn't have, we didn't even have computers. Like it's ridiculous. Beck, you know, I joke, I tell them, yeah, in 1890, I know we didn't even have computers. So, <laughs> uh, our joke. Um, so I used to carry around a big bag, like a duffel bag of like CDs wow. and scores. You know, just yeah. mark it and photocopy the pages of the score where the excerpt was, mm-hmm. write it down. The one really, another important thing I have students do, and I, I realized is I, um, I have them get a manuscript book for tim- a blank manuscript book for, for timpani and percussion. Mm-hmm. And I have them like, as part of being organized, work out um, each excerpt. Like work out all the details, write down stuff. Because you remember, you know, when you write, for me, at least when I write it down, I remember it. So... There's like, um, in, in like Hindemith, for example, symphonic right. metamorphosis, there's this um, big timpani excerpt um, and it's played earlier in the piece by, by trombone. Uh, Tuba, yeah, yeah. Yeah, da 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 And sometimes they have a little slide in there. Right, but yeah. You can get these details, and I tell them it's like a puzzle. You have to kind of figure out why do you why write this part for timpani and why is it at this point in the piece and mm-hmm. what, what are you bringing to this at this moment so i would go i would actually go and you know it was strange a lot of our parts are missing some of the articulations that you guys have hmm. um i don't know if it was at the time he didn't think that we could do it or they just wasn't you know it wasn't as de- it clearly wasn't as developed um as the other instruments um so i actually went and wrote those articulations in and because again, we're simulating what you guys do earlier. Wow. So why not? Uh, I think it makes it a little more special, you know, than just playing exactly what's on the page. Um, so my point with the manuscript book is I tell them, you know, you can work out a lot of information. You can write a whole book on this thing because they're all great masterpieces. That's why we're playing them for, for many, many years. Right. Um, but, but by the end, get it to like one page. So you have that one page next to the sheet of music that you're looking at and then you're looking at that and you're kind of cross-referencing while you're practicing it so it's like very organized and you're only hitting the correct you know things you need to fix instead of just like because i've noticed students like they'll play piece they'll look at it they'll, they'll just have their part you know and we'll have a lesson and they'll say oh yeah you know but you're missing these accents or this note's late okay and they'll fix it so then tomorrow they'll, they'll go and practice probably and they'll they'll, they'll get it because they had a lesson yesterday but slowly over the next few days, they're going to forget some of that stuff. It's going to be like, right. oh, I got to focus on this now because this note's late and that, that's gone. And then you just start creating bad habits. That's why I just first get the music. I work it out like a com- composer or conductor. I always tell them that too. I mean, make, <laughs> attack it from a different angle mm-hmm. and then record it like five times in a row. And then you'll see like, oh, I, I always play this note slow. I always drag this note, right? And then you, you, go, you go back and you just hammer it and you go to the score and say, okay, well, they have a slur over these two notes. Um, I'm gonna put that in my, I'm gonna write that down. And then you play it differently. And then you record it until it sounds right. And by then it's like ingrained. You know, it's like sports when they say they're in the, the oh, well, he, he really, he won the championship because he, he was in the, in the moment or in the game. That's because he's not thinking about it. Yeah. He, did, he did that part so many times wow. that working it out. You don't have to think about it. You would you say that going through that, – that was extremely detailed. Thank you. Um, would you say, like, going through that process is what separates people from becoming um, or being in an orchestra or not, or just taking that next level? Yeah, I think so. Because, like I said, you have to think like the other instruments. You have to take into consideration – or not even that. Just think about, you know, the 
why why your part is there at that moment at that time you know because i always tell them like beethoven for example is usually only two notes and it's like the <laughs> hardest hardest and most fun music to play for us but i always tell them who wants to hear i don't want to listen to an a and a d natural on <laughs> But I want to hear Beethoven 9, um, the coda in the first movement. I'd, I'd love to hear that. Yeah. But to just hear a D natural on symphony, I could care less, you know? <laughs> yeah, it almost feels like, um, sounds like being a tuba player, just playing whole notes. <laughs> the whole time. Right. I think it, it's good for any, not just a percussionist, but any instrumentalist to think about other instruments too. And oh, playing yeah. things And look at the parts of other instruments. That's, that's pretty good advice. For all of us. A lot of conductors have said that to, I've noticed in, in the orchestra too at times, like, oh, you can, can we make the strings, can we make this pizzicato sound like a timpani? Mm -hmm. And you know what, whether it does or not, it's very kind of objective, but um, um, it's definitely different. And yeah, so you, you, you're saying you can, you definitely tell with, with your colleagues in the field, like, oh, like when a conductor makes that comment, it does, it does enhance the music, it does change, it does make a difference for a better performance. Yeah, it's a different way of thinking about it because I feel like even even professionally, a lot of people are very like, my instrument, I'm concerned about sounding good and I have to nail this part. But it's mm -hmm. like, once you get out of that a little bit, um, you know, it's it's better, I think. Gives you a wider range of sound too, I think. Yeah. Sounds you can make on your instrument. Yeah. So you have numerous performances uh, with LA Phil weekly. Um, how do you balance all of this, having three concerts a week and, and it's just going and going and going? How do you like keep up uh, your your chops or what brass players would say chops or, you know, all your composing work? How do you balance it? Or how do you stay so organized being so busy? Well, I don't know if I'm organized, but, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, practicing, I, I, I honestly, I don't have a lot of time to practice because we're mm -hmm. playing so much. Um, you know, it's not like if we do a Beethoven symphony, it's not like I have to go, go and I have my, I have a, a, my own room at Disney Hall with, you know, an extra sets of timpani that I can go and practice in 24 seven, except for now uh, with this lockdown. But um, I don't really need to go in and, you know, shed in my, in my hands. It's, a lot of it's more at home, just looking, listen to recording, look at this, look at my part, look at the score and make sure I'm prepared. Um, so I, it's again, it's not like a brass player where I need to really get my chops in shape. But there, we do do a lot of contemporary music, and that I do have to go in and spend time with the drums and figure because there's a lot of choreography. I call it with like tuning changes on timpanis. Like you know, sometimes you need another leg to get, make get all the notes uh, in tune because um, they write kind of crazy parts that are often you can tell are written at a, at a computer, but not really thinking too much about the idiom idiomatic you know, the way the instrument really works, but yeah. um, it, we, we, you know, I can make it happen. It's just that, that I have to actually go and practice. So it's more the contemporary music these days because we do do a lot of it. Um, yeah. But now, I mean, I, I, I've always said that um, a teach, the teaching at USC and playing in the orchestra, um, playing contemporary music, which I do a lot of and composing, they're all, I never like think about it differently. It's all the same. I think they all feed each other in, in good ways. Like I could be teaching and it, it's, it makes me think of something. Oh, I should probably try and play this piece next week. Like that, like this thing I'm talking about right now, it'd probably be better. You know, they all kind of um, feed each other. And then conducting like my professional ensemble at USC, it's like I may get some idea about something I'm writing, and go home that night and just like jot it down. You know? yeah. yeah, for sure. So, now we're going to move on to audition preparation. And you already kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, what would you say is a good timeline when preparing for an audition? A good timeline? I think a month. Like, I don't think you need to have more than a month. Yeah. Because you just burn out. Maybe if it's like a big audition or you, don't, you, you feel like you need more time, you know, of course, don't wait until the last minute. But if you're making a little more time, I think it's OK. But, but like I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, um, you know, running mock auditions in the first week. And when you're preparing for that audition, like how many, um, you know, hours of good practice do you think it's good to put in a day? I think as much as possible. I yeah. was kind of crazy about it because um, my mentality is, you could be practicing. I was always just worried, you know. 
I'd be practicing 16 hours a day, but there's probably someone who's practicing a little bit more. So they're probably going to win. That was always in the back of my head. It's kind of crazy, but yeah. <laughs> it worked for you. <laughs> well, it worked, yeah. <laughs> yeah argue it worked. With um, so, yeah. I mean, I think if you're putting in only a couple hours a day, it's not enough. Yeah. No matter how good you are. You know, I think you need to, um, you know, you should be thinking about it a lot. It should take up most of your day for sure. Definitely. So with, with that, um, what are some effective ways for per that percussionists can practice, especially now being away from their instrument if they have, when they, when they have like concert solos and stuff going on, um, you know, not a lot of percussionists have the instruments needed <laughs> in the home, you know, so wh what, what ways have you practiced um, to get better without instrument? Um, well, the two main things are, you know, like I said, you can study a lot of music. Like I'm having my students do that now, even though a lot of them have instruments now. Luckily, USC paid to send everyone most of the instruments, even That's timpani great. and marimba, so it's great. They even sent me some timpani, so I'm pretty happy about that. Um, so I guess I should go practice, but um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, um, yeah there's, there's just that, like, like a, a lot of just... I think I told them I think it's a good time for them. It's not a break, but it's a good time to just step back and think about what you're doing and, and iron out some of these smaller details. And yeah. like we can we can practice timpani at a piano, well, ear training. You know, it's all about it's all about like being really sharp with your intervals because that's how we tune. You know, it's just like perfect fourths, fifths, thirds, half steps, or whatever. Uh, getting really sharp with that, so we can do that on a piano or a marimba or a mallow instrument or whatever, or sing into your tuner. Now everyone has a tuner on, app on their phone. Um, you can do that. Um, and then the other thing I talked about was the practice pad, which you can bring anywhere and it's not loud. And that's yeah. just to get your hands, you know. We have, we have things called rudiments, which are like scales for you guys. They kind yeah. of like, they're different patterns that keep our hands um, in shape and uh, moving the right way when, when needed. Um, and like when I was in high school, I just had a really great teacher who kind of hammered those into me. And I still, um, you know, I still use it almost every time I warm up. It's like our scales, basically. Hmm. I have that foundation, so it keeps me really um, in good shape most of the time. And I, and I can notice when students or people didn't have that when they were younger, it's kind of hard to get them to build up to that, to get that solid foundation. But that's kind of our scales and our foundation. For sure. Wow. Well, that, that that's amazing. I'm sure a lot of our percussion watchers are are right, grateful for that, for that response. Um, Sophie, do you have any, any more questions? No, I, I think we've covered a lot. Um, do you have any, like, any last tips for, for students in this time of quarantine <laughs> for people aspiring to be in orchestras? Um, yeah, I guess, you know, it's not a break. Just because you're trapped at home, it feels like, like my kids were saying, I have young kids and they're doing school online and they just yesterday was Sunday um, and they're just starting to understand like days of the week and what happens on Sunday versus Monday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my oldest daughter was like, okay, so vacation's over. We're going to school tomorrow, right? I said, no. <laughs> That's good. At least you understand it's Sunday and Monday. But yeah, I, I told my students like it's not a break. Um, and the thing I always say no matter what is you have to, and I still do it myself. This is like my number one thing is you always have to stay curious. Just because I could go in now and practice my timpani that are in my garage and um, open up a basic etude book and I'm still going to be curious about how I can like do something different or better or just make it different now you know so yeah. I think just remain curious and keep going because we'll be back yeah for sure yeah well, thank you very much for coming onto the channel today. We really appreciate your time. I'm sure our fans really appreciate you as well. Um, we're gonna, if it's okay, we're gonna leave uh, your contact info and your website below because we checked out your website and it was amazing <laughs> to check out all the cool things that, that you've done uh, throughout your career, especially your, your, your composing. It, it's just amazing to see, it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Good luck with quarantine and stay healthy.